welcome to another episode of We're Not Wizards. My name's Richard. I will be your host for this evening. And that was a bit more singy song than I meant it to be. But, you know, these things happen and this is what we do. We, we don't bother editing. As our guest is going to find out, we're just going to go jump in and find out what it's all about. Joining me today is a gentleman by the name of Chris Davis. And Chris Davis... Hello. Is from Windborne Games. And Chris Davis likes to jump in and say hello before he's officially introduced, but that's fine. <laughs> as, like, as we went over before, I don't play by the rules. <coughs> no, you definitely don't play by the rules. You are a maverick. You're a maverick, you space mountain rider, you. Um, <laughs> and this is um, it's a quick start on the Kickstart episode. Now, what we do in a quick start on the Kickstart is sometimes there will be people who are running Kickstarter campaigns... And we are in the middle of the Kickstarter campaign, which Windborne Games is running, for their game, Runes of Ragnarok. So, we've invited Chris on, because I saw a post on Facebook, and then, as usual, I went, oh, he's releasing a game, let's go and talk to him. And we had a conversation, and it kind of came about from there, didn't it, Chris? Absolutely. So there you go. So thank you, first of all, for coming on. Well, thanks for having me. It's a pleasure. It's, um, it's going to be fun because your your game looks rather interesting. Um, for people who are joining us for the first time, hello, thank you for joining us. Um, if you look outside, we have a range of fruit smoothies. There's banana and strawberry, there's peach and passion fruit, and there's also one that's got yogurt, which is probably going a bit off it. I would maybe potentially leave it alone. The reason that we do this is because we... We quite simply believe that there's not enough podcasts about board games. In fact, it's official. We are one of two in Scotland. <laughs> and, the other, <laughs> and the other one is the lovely people that I met at the Glasgow Gaming Festival recently, which is uh, Unlucky Frog Gaming. So quick shout out to those guys. If you like us, check them out because they're just as Scottish, except they're a little bit more Scottish because they're based more kind of Glasgow way, which is even more Scottish than us. And the second reason that we do this is because um, we like to chat to people like Chris to find out a little bit more about them and then also, by association, find out a little bit more about this fine game that he is currently searching for funding. So what we want to do, um, we're going to have a little kind of jump back into the, I guess, into the, the mythology of the past. We're going to kind of have a quick stare at the rainbow road of the present before we saunter off into the Ragnarok of the future. That's probably the worst statement ever, but I'm sticking with it. So it was beautiful. <laughs> thank you very much, Mr. Davis. You're far too kind. Um, do you want to tell us a little bit about how you got into the hobby in the, kind of in the first place? Uh, just a little bit about your history. Um, so I started out just playing video games as a kid like most of our generation okay um and playing you know the normal family board games like uh, scrabble monopoly that kind of stuff and as i got older i got into magic the gathering okay and um were you a big actually were you a big collector of magic yes <laughs> <laughs> too much money okay how many how many cards did you have i never bothered to count that's a, that's a lie. But but, but I, I I will say that I still don't know where to put them all to this day. Okay. So what we're we looking at more than ten. Yeah, a little more than ten. More than a thousand? May uh maybe? Five thousand? Prob- probably. Five thousand? You know, let's just let's just say around five thousand because I honestly <laughs> have no good concept of what that looks like. So, sure, 5,000. That's what I tell my wife. I've definitely yeah. only got 5,000 magic cards. <laughs> now, now, my wife is the one who got me into it. Whoa, so, between okay. the two of us, it's probably like 10,000 cards. Really? <laughs> yeah. That's just... Well, that's fine then, because then you've got... You don't have to do the, the kind of the sneaking kind of in with the mysterious package under your arm. What you been buying again? Nothing, honey. <laughs> just going to the den. Yeah, yeah, nothing. What well, are you picking Anyways. up the sleeves for? <laughs> <laughs> but uh, Runes of Ragnarok was actually born out of my love of magic. All right. Um, so I liked the combat games, but I, I didn't like that you had to keep spending tons of money mm-hmm. every, uh, every you know, day. So 
uh, yeah, we started out just designing a very, very small, like, uh, compact game that we could take with us. Mm-hmm. So, um, but I've, like, always been designing games in general, and so Runes of Ragnarok was my first that I started, like, over ten years ago, and then I put aside for ten years. All right. And I designed a bunch of just little games, and I got into gaming with my other friends more and more with the board games, but... Um, like I just play whatever anyone brings to the table, basically. <laughs> so were you were you the type of person that would take a game and house do different kind of rules for it, invent your own rule sets for it, or were you a guy that was always just you know white pad and pen, pieces of paper, mucking about with rule sets for yourself, inventing kind of like your own games? Um. I, I board games. I always play exactly how the designers want me to play them because mm. I don't. It's like you know, you design this. I'm gonna I'm gonna do what you wanted me to do, and you know, respect your choices. That's why I was. <laughs> <laughs> so okay. Um, as as I got more and more into design myself, yeah, and just um, I also I also actually work in video games professionally. Oh, so, okay. So. As as I start looking at more and more of these like Kickstarter games that I'm backing and getting them, I'm going like, you guys didn't think about all the rules here and all of the potential situations, and so I'm finding with some of them, I'm having to tweak the rules to create a better gaming experience or one that just makes sense in situations they didn't necessarily plan out. So I th- more and more of these days, I will tweak. <laughs> well, I think that's kind of encouraged. I mean, I think um, you know through. Especially through Board Game Geek, I'm always kind of seeing there seems to be the, the couple of the flavors where you get kind of people checking the rules, and you also get guys kind of like um, openly looking at variations. I know the um, Dark Souls board game, I know that um, David Carl's been quite open to say, well, listen, here's a rule set, you can try this instead. If you want to do like a boss rush mode, you can do that kind of instead yourself. So they've been quite open and flexible. And I think that's just maybe the type of the type of game Dark Souls is, is there's so many different ways to play it that I think they went, well, we can run with our rule set, but let's leave it open and see how other people kind of want to play it as well. What is sure. it? What is it you do in the um, the video game industry then? Um, I mean, I've been video game industry is pretty. Um, you move around jobs a lot, uh-huh. so uh, I mean, I've worked on like Guitar Hero. Final okay. Fantasy, uh, Wildstar, which is an MMO, uh, and currently I work um, in Match Three mobile games. Oh, okay, cool. So. Okay, okay. Yeah. So are you uh, are you des- are you a kind of programmer, designer, graphic boy, sound sound guy? What is it you? Uh, I am a designer. Oh, you're a designer. Oh, so, cool. Okay. So okay. yeah, depending on the company, that can be a very very complex job. Yeah. Or other companies, it's just like hey, make make some levels. Okay. So, okay. do you find that you're um, are you applying any of the stuff that you're kind of learning as you become a des- more of a designer in the board game stuff? Are you applying that to work? Do you get that flexibility, or do you do the other side? Do you take some of the stuff that you've been doing in your job and applying it to how you're putting together the games that you're making? So the the game design aspect itself doesn't quite translate, at least for the at least for Runes of Ragnarok, but other aspects do like um, learning the social media, interacting with fans, the transparency, reading data, and all the metrics that are coming through across your way. So yeah, that kind of stuff for my job has definitely helped to translate over. Okay, okay, cool, cool. Anything you've been playing at the moment that you kind of you kind of want you getting to the table on a regular basis? Obviously, apart from. Runes of Ragnarok, I guess you've got that to the table, the table a that's, couple that's of times. That's my work game, no. That's, I, is, that I know, is it, is, do you get to the point where you're like, I know I have to play this and try and break it, or <laughs> are you are you still able to kind of, I mean, what have you been kind of playing recently? So, one of my, the staples that I like bringing to the table are the uh, DC deck builders. Oh, all right, okay. Those, those are just lots of fun. Like, all my friends, we know the rules. It's very casual, easy to pick up, just get going. Uh-huh. Um, and one that I got to the table this last weekend, after months of it just sitting on my shelf, was uh, Tiny Epic Quest. 
And that was a lot of fun. Uh, we didn't get to finish our game yet. So I've got it, like, just pictures of the whole board, and I'm, like, eager to get oh, back into that. I've so done that. I've so done that when um, I used to play Mice and Mystics with the kids. Mm-hmm. And used to be wary that when they were quite young, they had a limited attention kind of span. So when right. you knew that they were kind of, like, wanting to do something else, it used to just freeze, take lots of photographs from above, everybody's equipment cards, what the board was like what the status yeah. of everything was, and then kind of carry on from that. Is well, it... We used to do that with Monopoly when I was a kid, really? you know? It's like, all right, everyone get different Ziploc bags. This is my money. <laughs> 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 what, did you have epic games of Monopoly or something? Oh, those things lasted days. Really? <laughs> oh, yeah. Me and my sister were were really, really into it. <laughs> did you Did you ever... Okay, here's here's the rule then. See when you had to pay a fine? Did you put it in the middle that everybody then won it if they landed on free parking, or did it go back into the bank when people paid a fine? Cause this oh, you're a... asking about you're asking about the home rule. Ah, uh, yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. No, we did we did the free parking pot. All oh, right. Yeah, no, that was I. Now, to be fair, when I was a kid, I didn't know that wasn't the rule, and I learned <laughs> later, and I was like, "Well, it's stupid to not have that." Like, <laughs> and what's the point of having free parking if you're not actually benefiting out from the? Yeah. You know. But then there was other rules as well. We used to play the rule where you didn't have to buy the property if you landed on it. And then yeah. and then you get ones that are like, no, you have to. And it's like, no, I don't want yeah. to. I don't want to buy. I don't yeah. want to buy that kind of property at all. Um, <clears throat> so, Tiny Epic um, Quest. Um, yeah. is, it as, is it as tiny as people make it? Because <laughs> it comes in a really small box, I noticed. So that, that's the interesting part. Yeah. The box... Is very tiny. The box is very tiny. A lot tiny. of the pieces are very tiny. Yes. When you set this game up, my table wasn't big enough. <laughs> no, it was it was a narrow table, but it was like the whole board. Yeah. Like you set up all these cards, and they make your board. And it's random, and then you've got all your player cards, uh, but you've also got like the quest cards, your um, your round tracker card. This spell tracker card, and then all the item meeples on their little item display rack, and it's like, no. No, the game, once it's set up, is bigger than several games I've played. <laughs> it's, like, it's like that, I've got this, or I've got Scythe. I've got this, but, or I've got Scythe. But, it, but at least the box is small on my shelf. I so. suppose. I suppose. Then you get monster boxes. I know I know that um, I've seen people take um, mechs versus minions down the gym. To kind of bench press it, because <laughs> I don't know if you've seen the size of that box. Yeah, you know that that thing's pretty big. Yeah, you know I mean, it's like how much you press. <laughs> it's like I'm benching, brother. No, I've got a Max versus an Minions game. here. Oh, it's fantastic! I can't. I'm not allowed to talk about Max versus Minions anymore. <laughs> I've been banned. Oh. It's like I should ring the Max versus Minions bell to say I've mentioned it on the episode because I'm still. Totally, really, really liking the game. Um, I, you should just look for sponsorship then. Ah, obviously. no, no, they, you know they're 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 threatening lawyers. <laughs> oh. <laughs> just leave us. <laughs> Riot Games are just like no, you cannot keep sending us all these lovely presents. We are not going to give you money to talk about our game on the show. We don't need <laughs> a, we don't need any presents or anything from you. And we've got enough money as it is, so it's all fine. So yeah, so we can't, we can't, um, we can't talk about that um, in case you know certain things will happen. That's not true. I understand. No, that's just a lie. That's just not. <laughs> they don't. Oh. E- they they don't even oh. notice me. <laughs> to be honest, <laughs> it's like sad old man in the corner. But that is a good game. It's a good fun game, and I've been playing it kind of, kind of an awful, an awful lot. Um, <clears throat> is there anything else you've been playing at the moment that you're, you're kind of enjoying? Uh, oh, uh, Overlords of Infamy. Oh, okay. Yeah, I that, that w- I can't say I know of that one. Is that a, okay. is that another deck? Is that a deck building game, or is that another? Is that miniatures? No, game? it's it's um, it's a, a resource management a worker placement. All right, you're you're, but uh, you're you're playing a villain, and you've got all of these like villain plots that you're going to do and it's a very tongue-in-cheek uh funny game and yeah i I recommend looking into that one so 
Are you got a, I mean, have you got a regular group that you play with then, or is it? I mean, it sounds like your wife's quite into the into the kind of the cardboard. Do you do you often spend right. the night kind of just putting something down on the table and just playing away at it? Usually weekends, we'll we'll get some friends over that and uh, and she and I, and we'll just play some board games uh, whenever we have time. You know, mm-hmm. obviously with the with the Kickstarter campaign going on, it's like, well, we're <laughs> like doing fourteen events. Um, maybe we have like thirty minutes next Tuesday. So, <laughs> well, I mean, King Dom no twice then. <laughs> Basically, <laughs> you get a good get a good game of that. I don't know what's at a, where's your commitment to the hobby, Chris. I mean, pff, what's going on? Um, <laughs> and then, is there anything that you're kind of looking forward to that you're kind of thinking, right? Once the campaign is finished and done, and then we can put, you know, start looking at the manufacturing. Have you got any games that you've seen recently? You're going like, oh, that looks kind of nice. I'll have a have a shot of that. Um, I've been pretty busy, so I haven't been paying that much attention. Uh, one Kickstarter that's up right now that I'd love to see succeed is uh, Loot the Body. Uh, that that looks like just a fun, simple little RPG-ish card game. Yeah, I've seen that. In fact, I think I am currently in discussions with them um, with them um, getting them on the show. Potentially yeah. next, yeah. Potentially, potentially next week. That reminds well, me. Well, if you. Yeah. If you do have them on, uh, they they and us we were, we were having a little throwdown between our our creatures to see which was more badass. Okay, uh, I'm still unconvinced that they ever uh, beat us. All right, well, tell tell yeah. you what, um, I'll just I'll email them just now. Well, here I'm speaking to <laughs> Chris from when I <laughs> came out windiest. Damn you, autocorrect. <laughs> From Windborn Games, and he said he didn't think you won. Didn't yeah, the, the, our creatures were better than theirs. He didn't think your creatures. Oh, creatures were able to beat his ones regards Richard <laughs> so just send that I'll just uh, send that to him perfect I'll just send that to him right now <laughs> because there's nothing like stirring up stuff he's going to get back to me and saying I'm not doing your flipping show <laughs> you can just go away <laughs> smack talking me down this will good because when Jason, when Jason comes on, um, we'll obviously have a response, and then we can turn this into some kind of ongoing, kind of, uh, I guess, yeah, kind feud, of feud. Yeah. yeah, always good. It's always good. I if, love it. Everybody likes a fight. We'll see if Jason will respond I, during the actual uh, chat itself. <laughs> I, I have been telling my wife that our company lacks a proper arch nemesis, so you know, it'd be nice. I think, yeah, I think, yeah, I think you kind of need a, a kind of a bad guy. Um, but we'll see if Jason comes back to us, and we will. And even when he does come back to us, we'll kind of make sure that everybody's aware of kind of what go, what kind of goes on. Um, you are sitting there with ruins of Ragnarok sitting on the the shelf for ten years. Yeah. Which is almost like you know that's like almost like Captain America getting frozen away at the the war and then yeah. getting thrown out what mm-hmm. decided to um what made you decide to kind of go actually let's get the game back off the shelf and let's frost it out and then you know tell him all his friends are dead <laughs> <laughs> sorry thor every, everyone's dead no i mean what made you to i mean what made you decide what made you think oh, actually you know this is sitting so, here and and let's let's give it a shot and see what happens with it So, uh, I was making board games before I actually got into the video game industry. And at the time, it was basically like, well, I can design these in my home, no problem. uh, And then I'll try to put them out there. And 
this was all either before Kickstarter existed or it was barely existing. I don't remember the timeline exactly. And so it wasn't really a proper medium for this kind of thing yet. And so I was trying to submit to actual game companies that were still accepting submissions. And uh, as I was like finishing up the game, they were all drying up and saying, we're not taking submissions anymore. So it was like, I, I didn't know what to do with the game at that point. Uh-huh. So I put I put it on the shelf and I, I kind of just let it sit for years. And then last November, actually, I started really getting into board games again with a group at work. And we we're just playing all sorts of new games. And they're bringing in all these Kickstarter games that I've never seen. Yeah. And I start realizing, oh, like... Kickstarter is a really, really good place for this nowadays. Like, there's actually an audience and and an expectation of this kind of stuff. So, I uh, dusted off the old uh, Runes of Ragnarok and said, "Let's let's make this happen." And um, when I did, ten years had passed, and my game was crap. <laughs> so, you know, the game industry <laughs> evolves so fast. So, I realized I I had to get to work. So, do you still have a copy of the? The crap version. Of Runes. Oh, definitely. Do you never, never delete anything? Yeah, you gotta, you gotta keep with it. It's okay. It's not that it was a crap game. What happened was it was more like it was going to be like a five to ten dollar game that you play, you know, here or there, but don't really give much thought to, uh-huh. kind of thing. Like the whole game actually fit in this small pouch that was. Probably smaller than your fist. So it was pretty much like Magic the Gathering. <laughs> Close to it. Yeah. It was it was there were there were the five dice that you <clears throat> rolled and then just some tokens for the creatures themselves. Alright, okay. And that was the game. There there it wasn't what it is now. There were no spells, heroes, abilities, all that other stuff. It was just a very watered down game. So did you I mean, did you Keep the key concepts, or did you decide, right? Listen, I gotta, I gotta just step away from this for a bit. I gotta kind uh, of come back to it and kind of look at it up with a fresh set of eyes. No, the core concepts remained absolutely the same. So, the 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 core mechanic in the game has always been: you roll five dice, which are now the, the rune dice, and based on those symbols, what do you do? Yeah. And so now it's, you know, you, you gain the focus, which is the currency, and that's how you're buying your creatures or upgrading your hero. You've got four different spell types for affecting creatures and just, like, modifying combat and kind of screwing over your opponents. But, like, that core mechanic of the dice rolling it absolutely remains the same. All right. Okay. 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 Was there a change in the art? I mean, is the art style kind of stayed the same, or when you were realizing that you well, were there gonna... was no art. All oh, right, okay. So there, <laughs> are... because the answer to the question, yes. <laughs> <laughs> What's that stick I... man, Chris? That's Thor. <laughs> Can't yeah. you tell if he's he's, Can't got you his... tell he's he's got a hammer? He's got a hammer. <laughs> yeah, it's not a T. It's a hammer. <laughs> he's got he's got like he's got like a helmet with wings. I thought he was wearing a chicken. <laughs> There, there you go. Chicken wearing Thor. Chicken. That has to be a stretch goal. <laughs> Special request. Chicken Thor. Chicken Thor has to happen. <laughs> or just a chicken that's dressed up just, to look like Thor. Phil, and you could yeah. be... No, and, and here's the thing, right? <clears throat> it's yeah. a curse card that comes from Loki. And the title of the card is Foul Play. <laughs> that's bad that's so bad and then you can play the card and what happens is you lose your powers and you turn <laughs> you turn into Thor the kind of the god of thunder chickens thunder chickens uh huh uh huh I gotcha and I'm gonna I'll draw Thor as a thunder chicken I I will absolutely not use that art <laughs> I am not bad at art I'm right I'm quite uh-huh. I'm quite okay. insulted. No, I'm not bad at drawing. You know what? I will give you an interview then. I will. I'm delighted. Thank you. Thank you. This is now recorded, so this is fine. But yeah, so, I mean, is it, 
I guess in choice of artwork, because this is something that we don't sometimes discuss with creators. Did you have an, did you have an overall view of the art itself? Did you have a design in mind to say, well, listen, we want it to be, we want it to be maybe we want it to be quite serious, or we want it to be maybe a little bit semi cartoony, or did you just go out there and see, well, guys, here's my idea. Come back to me with your pitches and let me know what you kind of think. I absolutely had a vision. <laughs> okay. So, so I I put out an ad and I got tons of people applying, and I knew that I wanted, um, you know, a good fantasy artist that had, um, not quite like the comic book art style, but not the like super detailed CG realistic fantasy art either. Yeah. I wanted between those two and it was important for me also that uh the artist knew how to use color and didn't just kind of do drab dark um you know apocalyptic scenes because i know that gets that gets tiring and when you're looking at the cards you want visual differences so i, yeah, I definitely had you know a vision and it definitely wasn't going to be like lots of greys and browns because if there's nothing worse than the apocalypse, it seems to all of a sudden it gets all grey and browny <laughs> with fire yeah. in the kind of the and fire in the kind of the background. So was that a long process? Kind of were you quite particular in picking the kind of the artists that you went with? Did you or did you kind of go through like almost like a process of narrowing it down between a couple of people? Or when somebody sent 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 you a piece and you went nope. That's our guy. That's the person. That's the person we're going to be using for this. They're they're the one that's going to get the job. I mean, there was a number of criteria, so it was like I didn't I didn't specifically set the price on the artist. I said, you know, what's how much do you charge? Um, I gave kind of a range, but that was about it. And uh, so I I had this huge spreadsheet, and it's like, all right, so here this guy sent me, you know, here's his his portfolio. So let's go through it. And we'll kind of analyze the different things they do. Here's his price point. Where are they located in the world? How good are they at communication? Because you don't want someone who's crap at communication. Because, you know, you've got a schedule to stick to. And uh, I broke it all down. And it it was... I'll say it was probably about a week to two weeks to go through everyone. And really whittle it down. And um, But it was it was very, very difficult. These guys are skilled and didn't make it easy. But it's really important though because I've seen I've seen games where the artwork can make such a big deal to how people kind of perceive the game. Yeah, I mean one yeah. of one of the latest ones I think that um, is I think the the art has had a really big effect on it. Is um, have you seen Roots? Yes. Yeah, no, the art on that is really cool. The art on that is very cool. And the art on that was the point of, like, I don't think I'm really fussed about <laughs> what this game is about. All I know is a lot of people have backed it, and it looks absolutely, you know, it looks phenomenal. It looks really, really good. Yeah. And that kind of made me think, oh, maybe I um, maybe I should consider kind of going down that line. But um, <clears throat> with yourself... It's kind of you've got a kind of a nice mixture of the kind of the the kind of the fantasy art here as well, without and it's kind of. Do you know what it's like? It's like if somebody had did a really really great version of what you would see on the kind of actiony, very well done kind of American cartoons from the eighties type thing. Okay. Do you know what I mean? I got gotcha. you. I do. I hope that's not insulting. <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 those those were those were those were cool. Yeah, exactly. Centurions and mask and stuff like that. Right. Maybe more the the Saban type stuff, you know. I'm not talking like the Wuzzles or anything like that. Does anybody remember the Wuzzles? I don't know. Um <laughs> you I, was, I was more of a Ninja Turtles guy. Uh yeah. Well we had we um in the UK for some reason because they thought kids were gonna go um oh, crazy uh-huh. that they changed the name to Hero Turtles. Yeah, I've heard that. So we had the Teenage Mutant hey, Hero Turtles for ages, and then people went out and got the comics and went, well, why is this called Ninjas? It's like, that's because that's what they were. And I think they even maybe went as far as changing it in the film, but I'm not 100% sure of that. Um, okay. tell, talk, but, uh, yeah. 
quick quick shout out though. Our artist is uh, Seta Triandi. Okay. And uh, yeah, he's amazing. And if anyone wants to copy our art, use him. <laughs> he's really good. Has he done quite a few games? I mean, is that one of the criteria that you looked at as well? Whether or not they've done a kind of like board game art as well? Uh, those guys were usually out of my price point. Really? <laughs> so, All no. Right, okay. uh, Seta, I believe, I believe he'd done one other game. And he's kind of like, he was, he was at finishing school and he was, he's trying to like start his own studio. So, mm. you know, he's, he's at that stage where he's like, I need to get my name out there and prove myself and, get people wanting me more and more and you know he's been absolutely amazing over the past god like eight months working with us yeah and so yeah and if we hit our stretch goals and whatnot then i'm gonna keep using him for even more stuff okay 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 because i mean i think what's apparent nowadays is that you don't you don't start spending money after you're funded you seem to spend money before you even get to the stage where you're kind of like pressing the go button on the campaign. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. You got to you got to invest, you know. You got to spend money to make money and you know, getting free artists or people to work for you just for free, it's like you know, the people on Kickstarter, they see that. They see that you're not really committed to the project if you're not even willing to invest. If you're not willing to invest your money, why should they invest their money? Yeah. Yeah. And you you want quality work, then you better, you know, put your money where your mouth is. It's the old exposure question, isn't it? I mean, if somebody, mm-hmm. somebody comes up to me and says, I'll tell you what, I will, if you can do this, this, and this for me, I will give you lots and lots of exposure. And it's like, where? <laughs> it's like, why are you asking, My... why are you asking for stuff for free if, if you, if you're so successful? My favorite rebuttal to that is people die from exposure. Oh. It's not something you want. <laughs> yeah, that's really good. I'm going <laughs> to, damn it. That's really good, Chris. Yeah, it's not mine, but I'll take it. I think we're going to have to credit it. <laughs> That's the name of the uh, episode, then. <laughs> <laughs> Cre- no, I don't know how to work that into the title. We'll think of something anyway. Um, Mechanics-wise, how do you actually play? How you know you're you're sitting down with you're sitting down with your copy? How do you okay. how do you go about kind of playing it? So. First off, it's everything you need to play is in the box. It's not any kind of collectible game. So some people have asked about that, and it's like you don't got to worry about like dropping tons of money. But it's we have a a, a tableau of creatures yeah. that um, you set up each game. There's 24 creatures in the game. You'll play with a five or six depending on the number of players, and all players will be going for the same pool of creatures, and You'll each get your hero, which is uh, one of four Norse gods, though we've got a couple more um, tucked away here that we're going to be releasing soon. Okay. Our first is actually when we hit 50%, we're going to reveal the next hero to the world. So you've got your hero, and each hero has unique abilities that you can use throughout the game. And then you've got the rune dice. And when you the rune dice are what you're going to roll each turn to decide on what spells you get uh you get the focus or money that you get and all that so you'll roll the you'll roll the rune dice you'll buy creatures you'll get spells and then buy any upgrades for your hero that you want and that that's that's a basic turn in the ready phase and everyone will take a turn in the ready phase building up their armies empowering their hero and all that kind of stuff and then you'll go to combat and then when you're in combat, you got all these creatures and spells, and you just start attacking each other and uh, slinging spells around to, to kind of just power up your own guys and weaken your opponents. Uh, the way our combat works is a little different from other combat games. Yeah. So it's um, any creatures you attack with or block with, you just total up all of their attack and defense and treat it as a single unit, basically. There's no, like... I attack with this guy, and then, like, I block this guy over here, but not this guy. It's, you're not finagling all of the individual creatures. It's literally just comparing the numbers of both sides. All right, okay. And it's, yeah. It's a much simpler system, and people are able to pick up on that a lot quicker. Yeah. I've seen that used in, um, I think, at Marvel Dice Masters. I think, um, 
a lot of games, um, the Final Fantasy card game, you've got the option to decide whether you're going to block an attack or kind of kind of let it through. But um, yeah, you're right. It can lead to confusion, especially when you've got life points on the Final Fantasy figures of like several thousand, <laughs> and it's like, well, why can't you just take the zeros off? <laughs> it's like you gale yeah. all over again. Um, <clears throat> yeah, and you were so you you've you basically you face off one one against each other. Is it then a case that you're you're trying to reduce the life points of the I guess the the god that you're playing? Then is that the, the end? The end kind of results, yeah. yeah. Yeah, so <clears throat> Last God Standing wins is uh, is the game. Okay, okay, okay. How long is it taking to play? So, you know, assuming you actually know the rules and are comfortable with the game, mm-hmm. uh, my wife and I, we, we complete games in about 20 to 30 minutes. Uh, the more people you add into the game, the longer it takes. So two-player games, we say, are typically around 30 to 40 minutes. Uh-huh. And a four-player game, you're going to be running an hour and a half, probably. And how do you how do you play a four-player game, then? Oh, it's free-for-all madness. Uh, so, the tricky bit with the game is, you know, you attack with some creatures, and we do have an exhaustion mechanic, so any creatures that you attack with, they can't block. So if you go first in the round... You know, you want to be pretty cautious because there's three more people going after you. So you just got to be careful and watch your step as you go. So you basically, yeah. So you, you you can, have you got the option to like form an alliance? I guess you can form alliances with people. You can decide to gang up on other people as well. Oh, yeah. I mean, I don't explicitly say, hey, no, you know, manipulating your friends <laughs> in this game. <laughs> <laughs> Passing them ten dollars or something like that. Now remember what happened I, last I, time. I love when players like start bargaining with each other. Like, well, don't attack me. Attack, attack him, and and then I won't attack you with this or you know whatever. Like, it's so much fun. And something that um, you can do in this game is like you know you've got all of your spells, and it's like you know you could be in combat against someone. And then, you know, player three just off to your side says, you know what, F it, I'm throwing a spell in here, and uh, I'm just screwing with all your combat. <laughs> he's like, <laughs> gonna he's, you he's not even in combat, and he's still he's still just kind of messing with you. <laughs> I always think this missing from sometimes these things is like, um, almost like universal bribe dice. So you have like two or three dice, which are just like, you know, they're just like faceless, and you can just say, I'll tell you what, I'll give you your... Here, here's a universal bribe dice. I can give that to you. And you can choose whatever thing you want to kind of all the face on the dice. And if you gave players that, I think that would be cool. I'm still up for the, the, um, the Thor chicken, though, if you want to run with a Thor chicken <laughs> <laughs> instead. Well, you're making me remember the, uh, the Thor frog from the Marvel comics. <laughs> <laughs> when he, Loki turned him into a frog. <laughs> Are you, I mean, are you a big fan? It's kind of like the Thor from the Marvel Universe. Is that kind of like your jam? Was that kind of your inspiration for kind of getting involved? Are you more like generally interested in the Norse mythology side of things? Well, I've always been interested in Norse mythology, Mm. but the Thor comics are actually more my wife's thing. All right, okay. So so she's really into the Thor comics. Uh, I'm more of a Spider-Man guy. Are you? Okay. Yeah. So... I saw I saw Homecoming, the was first time. Yeah, I saw it like about three four days ago. I was um, I was pleasantly surprised um, by Michael Keaton's performance in it because he really didn't. He really wasn't traditional bad guy. No, he was he was really good. He, he was, was very just, very good. Yeah, just wanted to provide for his family. Was he better than your man Alfred Molina as Doc Ock? In Spider Man Two, though. Oh yeah. You th- oh, that's a controversial. That could be the most controversial. You you know, if this goes out, people might you know. Is it really that controversial? I think it's yeah. I think he's. I I I have a hard time just because I thought that movie suffered greatly from good vision and good good motivation for Doc Ock. Like yeah, I love I love Doc Ock in the comics and. In the movie, I just I wasn't convinced about what he was trying to do there. Really? Yeah. 
See, it was my favourite Spider-Man movie really up until Homecoming, mm. to be honest. What was your, what was your favourite one before Homecoming? Ooh. Uh... I got you thinking like, on the spot. I... You know, you can roll out the real thing to your game, but you get Spider-Man and you're having a serious thing. Well, I, I had my game prepared. That's, that's how it works. <laughs> I never said that the questions were going to be easy, Chris. No, you did not. Um, in fact, you told me I had to sing. I don't know. I, I, <laughs> I sent Chris a DM and we're organizing an interview just to say, and, and every, every time that people come on, we get them to sing the theme tune. <laughs> you came back and said, right, I'll be having shots <laughs> before I come on. <laughs> and I had this horrific vision of like you coming on kind of like half drunk <laughs> it's good it's a game okay it's about <laughs> it's about nothing it's apologies <laughs> do you want to see my thor's hammer ha kind of well thing. i had literally just walked out of thor ragnarok and i looked out of my phone i see this dm from you and i'm like what the hell is he talking about and my wife looks at my phone and she goes he's fucking with you <laughs> I'm like, no! It's like, yeah! <laughs> I was. I like to do that. It's just a check. That was all. Because, uh, you know, I be, I mean, I, we've sung the theme tune before. There isn't a oh, theme yeah. tune. There's intro music, but there's not like a proper theme tune. You know, we could probably make one up. I have, you know, I have, I have kind of no, no idea. Um, with you being, serious question. <laughs> <laughs> let's turn it it's like um, Montel Williams final thought of the day or something um, <laughs> um, with it being your first Kickstarter are you conscious of everything else that's out there is you know when the launch when you see other projects launching are you are you conscious of what else is on offer because it's, the thing with Kickstarter is it seems to be a juggernaut there seems to be constantly new stuff coming out all the time. Oh, yeah. You know, um, it's almost, you know, I've seen people say, well, I'm not looking at this game because the guy's only done three projects before. And it's like, oh, okay, then. I think Kickstarter was meant to allow people who had never done anything before to kind of create something. But are you right. were you more conscious of what else was going to be coming out around the, the time? Or did you just kind of, press the button and say, well, let's, let, this is our launch window, let's kind of go for it. I mean, I set up, I set my date. Um, I, I did actually set, uh, make my date around Thor Ragnarok, because I just was like, hey, everyone's talking Thor right now and Ragnarok, let's, let's do this. And I was aware of some of the projects that were coming out, and then on the day, I hit, I hit go, let's start the project. End of the day, I just see in all of the different groups going like, why are there so many projects today? This is overwhelming. <laughs> and I'm that. sitting back here going, oh, crap. This, this was Facebook. not the day for me. I saw that on Facebook. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's why I, I hit just, you. I think that's why I hit you up on Facebook. Because I saw I you like, could, so <laughs> you were like, so many. there's seven projects gone live today. <laughs> I can't remember the ones, but I remember seeing, was it... um. <clears throat> Which group was it? It wasn't Board Game Geek because I don't go there because it's just. Uh, there's the Board Game Group or board, whatever. There's like the generic Spotlight. Group. I think it oh, was. Spotlight? I think it was Spotlight. Okay. Yeah, I think it was James. Spotlight. James. James Hudson won. <laughs> just seen you halfway down the comments going, ah, oh, just launched mine today. Damn. <laughs> Everyone's <laughs> like, going, I've not got any money left. I'm gonna have to sell a child or something like uh -huh, that. Uh huh. Uh huh. But um. Yeah, it's like I kept up with the projects that came out the day that I launched. Yeah. And after that, it's like, I, I can't, I no. can't look at everyone else's and just keep like, it, you stress yourself out. Cause it's like, well, what am, you know, it's like, you know, you look at you, you tend to look at all the ones that are doing better than you. Yeah. And, and that's, you're just yeah. like, what, what am I doing wrong? Yeah. They came out after me. Why do they have more than me? What's going on? What am I doing <laughs> wrong? And, you just, you're over analyzing so much. And, you know, it is my first Kickstarter, so I'm, uh, no one knows me. <laughs> and, uh, you know, I, I probably could have done my marketing a little better on the front end, but I'm trying to pick it up now. And, you know, there's just so many people who, who get this system way more than I do. So try not to stress out. 
enjoy the ride and just uh you know get up there i don't think you can i don't think you can kind of the thing with kickstart it's not the it sounds strange but it's not the be all and end all it's not a case that you kind of get one shot of it and i have had a few people who have run a campaign once and then ran a campaign a second time and just stormed it into oblivion i mean i mean i've gone through these names before but you know, Mark Neidlinger, Orange Nebula, you know, cancelled within the first couple of weeks, came back and just did stupid amounts of money. There was uh, Mr. Keen, the fantastic Mr. Richard Keen, who did Dinogenics. Oh, yeah, I saw <clears> that one. You know, he ended up $144,000 and um, still hasn't done his thank you video in his T Rex outfit. But um, <laughs> I'm just putting yeah, that. that- that I mean, and that wasn't a kind of a going away for six months, then coming back and relaunching. He basically went, okay, it thingied in August, let's come back in kind of beginning in October. And I don't know if it was a different mood or if it was in between people having money, but it just kind of came back and, yeah. Those are the guys I want to pick their brains and be like, what did you do during that tiny gap, How like... Like, is it just that there was enough buzz from your first campaign that that it just happened naturally? Did you work your butt off to, like, generate a ton of buzz? Like, how did you do that? Because I'm not afraid of shutting the campaign down if I have to. Yeah. No, I think Richard... I'm okay with limping across the finish line, too. (laughs) Yeah, exactly. If you fund, (laughs) then you fund. If it makes you wonder, did I I go away and come back again? I think what Richard said to me, he said when I asked him, he said, he said, basically, it was... It was because I came on and did your podcast. That's what he said to me. <laughs> He's just like, you are the sole reason That's... that I have this much money. <laughs> That's... And then he offered you like half of it, right? Because no. it was your right? No, he didn't. No, he didn't. Oh, I wouldn't do that. I, you, I just... you should write him a strongly worded letter. No, I just walked on like, I walked on like <laughs> Kate. Kane and Kung Fu. I walked on to the next village to deal with their, pro- oh. <laughs> to deal with their problems. Like, uh, like, how oh, was it, Sam Beckett on a quantum leap? Pretty much, I kind of, I just phase, I phase shifted out of there, you know. Yeah. That's that's mm-hmm. how it could. I don't know. Do you know what? It's who knows because everybody's seen it <laughs> time and time again. You've seen Kickstarters that the people have just went nip, and then all of a sudden it captures people's imagination, and then it just kind of flies off. So it's always, it's always kind of very, very, very good. Um. In terms of your plans for the future, has doing the Kickstarter campaign, has that prompted you to pick up the pad and pen for other games that you've been thinking about and has it sparked the kind of the creative process for you to think, well, we've done this, can we do this, can we do that? You know, have you have you been looking at other kind of games and in the kind of the Mr. Davis collection of game ideas kind of thing? Uh, I've got probably four four more games in me at the moment. <laughs> so. Sounds a bit sore. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Just get those out of there. <laughs> the um, t- hope it's Tiny Epic Galaxies and not Scythe. <laughs> <laughs> but, oh, um, dear. So, I mean... I, I can't stop designing, and so when I was overwhelmed with Runes of Ragnarok and the Kickstarter and just all of this setup and management, I'm like, I need a break. I'm going to go design a game, but a different game. Okay. <laughs> so so my, my breaks are designing other games, and I've got two that I'm really excited about, and I want to try to get those going as soon as... Runes of Ragnarok successfully funds, and I'm I've been talking with my wife like, do you think it's stupid to start another Kickstarter campaign before I've fulfilled the first one? And I haven't answered that question yet because I, I I'm sitting here going like, eh, you know, maybe not all the backers are convinced that I'm I can do it because I haven't proven myself on the first one, but I've got all these other ideas that I really want to do now, so I don't want to wait. I think communication is important. I think there's, I think you can. I think um, James Hudson, when he was on, he said, well, Pizza Hut don't 
wait for one pizza to finish before they start making the next pizza. He he did say that. It's on. But they've already delivered many pizzas to prove <laughs> they can. <laughs> well, you can explain to him why that doesn't work then. Because <laughs> I ain't. Um, no, but I guess on the other side of it is um, it depends on how you handle the campaign. Because I think um, I think there's mm, people like communication. People don't mind bad news as long as you're actually telling them there is bad news. People don't like to wait six weeks and then be told, well, four weeks ago we were going to tell you this, but, you know, we had to go here, there and everywhere or we got caught up in this or we got caught up in that. So I think communication is very, very important. I think I've seen, I've seen, I've seen very, very supportive crowds turn edging on getting kind of annoyed to edge you know getting slightly um slightly nasty ish when the kind of the communication side of things kind of breaks down when people actually stop saying well this is this is what's happening this week or this is what's happening this fortnight kind of thing so it depends end of day chris it's up to you (laughs) i guess i mean that that is something i've learned from my, my my normal job like People, people want a certain level of transparency, mm-hmm. and yeah, you don't give it to them; they they start getting annoyed because they've given you money. Yeah, exactly. I think there's. Do you know what it is? It's like on Kickstarter when the campaign's going, nobody's actually handed over any cash, and until it actually hits the zero 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 on the campaign, then everybody is still kind of going along for the ride, and the energy is there, and everybody's kind of getting excited as. As soon as you know the the credit cards get processed and Kickstarter takes the money, I think that's when people can get on a little bit on the entitlement train and say, "Well, I've now funded you, so I kind of expect you to kind of maybe deliver." I don't know, but um, mm. as I say, nothing wrong with you just going out and seeing. You'll have a good um, you'll have a good idea of. I mean, what what are you thinking about? I mean, is it? I mean, are you thinking about something completely different? I'm not expecting you to tell me, because every time I ask this question to anybody else, they go, well, I'd like to tell you, but I'd have to kill you. And, you know, and you're far enough away, so I think that'd be fine. Um, <laughs> but hey, um, hey, I've been to the UK before. I, <laughs> physically I, I think I know where Scotland is. Oh, that's nice. <laughs> <laughs> well, your house is coming up on Google Maps. Um... <laughs> Uh, but, um, okay. Yeah, I, I can give you. I can give you some general ideas here. Yeah, go for it. Yeah, that'd be nice. Because uh, so we've got uh, two fantasy themed games. One is uh, just a straight card game that centers around a bluffing mechanic. Okay. Um, our second is kind of a, a it's a victory point questing game, uh, but yeah. Victory point questing game, and uh, merchants and heroes and all that kind of stuff, and both of those are actually going to be uh, very humorous games. Like I've done, I've done Ragnarok serious tones. I want something very lighthearted where you know people are just kind of amused by the cards and the play them play itself. So there's that. Uh, I've got an idea for a uh, kind of a command line game. Uh, but it's co-op. Oh, okay. Uh, that's a s- sci-fi theme. And uh, the fourth is probably more of a kids' game, actually, and that's a tile placement game. So that sounds pretty cool. That sounds pretty cool. So I think I'm going to go for the card games next because I want something that is easy to produce. It's like the the custom dice in Runes of Ragnarok just took so long to get everything settled and handled with the manufacturers and design and all that i'm like you know what that was cool let's do something easier <laughs> <laughs> no but i can imagine Cards. yeah i mean I it's it. yeah i mean nobody sits you down and says okay this is what all the stuff you have to go through and design and i can imagine being on a dice game you know that's like well we've got to get dice from somewhere where do we get dice from or where do we get specially kind of printed dice from i mean i guess all these kind of things kind of going through your head um so let's have a quick recap on the campaign let's have a quick check where we are 
How watch? How is your F5 key on your computer? Have you worn it away yet, or do you still have some of it left? Uh, I mean, the F is looking a little weak now. <laughs> But the five's just doing fine and dandy. Yeah, no, we we were we posted up some amusing memes on like uh, day one of like just any any gifts we could find of like mashing the F five key like that that was what we were doing. <laughs> um, it's it, it was rough, you know, just staring at it all day, and you know it's like day one you're super excited because you get all the backers. Day two it's a little weaker but still strong. Day three you're going, where is everyone? And then the weekend hits, and everyone's like outside doing other stuff or hanging out with friends. You're like, "Hello, hello." <laughs> Are you? I mean, is it kind of hard work to kind of do things like you know, stir up stuff in the comment section and things like that as well? Are these things that you're kind of keeping an eye on as well? Or, uh, yeah, no, we're we're trying to make sure that we're interacting with people as they're coming on. You know, if people have questions, we want to answer them. As quickly as possible, uh, and uh, any positive press, you know, we're like, hey, thanks, and you know, always there with the, the retweets and whatnot, interacting. Okay. So cool. it's it's basically a job, you know, that <laughs> may or may not pay off. <laughs> <laughs> but you've got plenty. I mean, you've got time left. You have got thirty days to go. You are almost at the you're at the forty five percent mark of the funding. So yeah, you know, you've got time. You've got time to go to go just now. Um, you know, and we're still climbing, and we're we're you know, we we think we, we can do it. Well, I mean, you've got um, I mean, you've got some decent reviews in there. You've got Mister Baraf, good old Edo, who mm-hmm. um, is that the unfiltered gamer? Yeah, uh, that was that was not a review. That was just us live playing it on his show. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. But I mean, people like to see that, though they like to kind of see the yeah. kind of the playthroughs and the feedback that's on the campaign seems to be very, very um, seems to be very, very positive indeed. How do people? How much money do they need to chuck in to get involved um, in this mythological kind of uh, joyride? Uh, the game only costs forty bucks, and that's for everything. That includes all stretch goals. And anything that we add to the game, that's just what it costs. So, you know, I didn't. I didn't want to charge everyone like three different tiers for different types of components and whatnot. Just yeah, you know, forty bucks gets you the whole game. Uh huh. And we are partnered with uh, Games Quest in the UK now, so okay, you know, we've got the friendly shipping, basically worldwide. So that's, that's good. That's good for all of the European backers over there. Yeah, I know those guys by name. It's quite unfortunate. <laughs> I can email them and they just say, "All right, yeah, it's you. yeah, don't worry, we'll get your stuff sorted out. It's all fine." <laughs> so that's a sad. Um, I don't know if that's a good thing or if that's a horrifically kind of bad thing. But that's, I mean, that's a good. Um, it's a good price point for forty dollars. I mean, I really, I really didn't want to go above forty because that's that's what I like to pay for a game. Yeah. So. I was like, you know, I'm I'm not gonna be that jerk who's like, well, I only want to pay forty, but you have to pay me sixty five. Like, mm. I wasn't gonna do that to you, <laughs> at least not out the gate. Like, that'll be like yeah, two years from now when I'm designing, you know, my big box game. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Now you gotta pay because now I've done I've done five games now, <laughs> so so I can yeah. command it. I'm gonna you know I'm gonna fund within five hours, so you know everything, my nice, uh, everything's like, gonna be cubic good. cubic meter box. You know, <laughs> it's like I think the- that should cover it. Like the gloom, the Gloomhaven one. Yeah, <laughs> it's kind of like what's your house built out of Gloomhaven, <laughs> <laughs> and there's just a door at the side. It's all made out of furniture. Either that or it's Kingdom Death Monster. That's my holiday. Yeah, that's my holiday home. Because it's it's just <laughs> equally as equally as huge. So forty dollars will get you in the door. You get your minion cards. You get your custom dice. You get your heroes. You get your relic cards. You also get the digital download. You get the runes. You get any applicable stretch goals. You've gone for quite a long kind of runtime as well because you've got thirty days left. Yeah. Well, it's that was that was kind of a fun um, stress <laughs> stressful thing to figure out because uh, when you're on all of the different forums for Kickstarter advice, 
everyone will give you different advice. So I tried conglomerating as much of that advice as possible. Mm. And um, it was like, well, you, if you're a first timer, you don't want to go less than 30 days. Like, okay, cool. I won't go less than 30 days. And then they're like, you don't want to end on, you know, a Friday through Monday. It's like, okay, I want to end on a Friday through Monday, I guess. <laughs> and it's like, you want to end on the 1st or the 15th. Okay, I want to end on the 1st or the 15th. It's like, you don't want to end if there's a full moon. It's <laughs> like, everyone's got more and more advice. It's like, okay, um, I'll just pick the 15th of December. <laughs> uh... <laughs> See how it goes. It's just before Christmas, everybody will be happy. <laughs> and so people, people have advice on that too. They're like, they're like, oh, that's terrible. Because everyone stops buying on Kickstarter at Christmas, and others are like, well, no, they're spending lots at Christmas time, so their wallet opens up, so Kickstarter's great. And it's like, you get exact opposite advice. <laughs> you just end up turning off the forums and kind of walking away. Yeah. <laughs> If people want to keep a, if people want to keep an eye on you on where you are on the interweb nets, where can we find you, Mr. Chris Davis? Uh, you can find us uh, mainly on Facebook and Twitter. We are at Windborn Games. Okay. And we've also got an Instagram and, of course, our Kickstarter page. Okay. And um, what we'll do is we will make sure that we get all those links. So we can put them in the show notes so that we have notes to show. Um, Perfect. One more question. Yes. You are a Viking that has died. Absolutely. You're a Viking that's died, okay? You're about to go to the halls of Valhalla. Okay. The Valkyries are here to take you off. You are allowed to take with you any three board games. It doesn't matter whether... It, if a game's got expansions, you can take all of them with you. If a game has multiple different va- editions, you can take whichever edition that you want. Okay. Unfortunately, the Valkyries have brought with them the smallest of the chariots, so it can only fit three games in. Before you set off to the Halls of Glory and Quaffers... Quaffers in? Potentially? Is that not hairdressing in French? I have no idea. But before you head off, <laughs> before you head off to the afterlife, what three games do you pick to take with you? The rules are: there's obviously going to be hundreds and hundreds of other people to play, and the question that's always going to get the yes answer is: Would you like to play a game of something? So, what three games would you take with you? Oh God! No! Oh, look at that! I accidentally stopped recording right there. Uh- <laughs> <laughs> Uh, well, should I take Runes of Ragnarok just so that they all have the glory? No. F that. I'm done with that game right now. <laughs> I just don't want to play it anymore. <sighs> First game. I hate you. I hate you. That's um, fine. I, you don't have to th- yeah, hate I'm, me. You I'm, have to hate I'm, the... take, I'm, I'm taking my DC deck builders, all right? Okay. I'm taking my DC deck builders. That's one game. Those are, those are good. Yeah, that's one. I will take... Can, can I can I take just a deck of cards? You can take a deck of cards with you as well. You can take whatever you want. Part of a game. I'm gonna, I'm, I'm gonna choose a deck of cards because <clears throat> because because that gives some variability there. Okay. And uh, if any game at all, Chris. You know what? Valkyries again. Monop- Monop- Mon- Monopoly. You're taking Monopoly, Monopoly with you. I'm going to take Monopoly. Oh my goodness. But your, sis- yeah. your sister's not going to be there. <laughs> so who are you going to play with? Okay. You just said everyone will always say yes. Yes, okay, that's fine. Okay, that's fine. Okay. And if, and if I can ruin everyone else's day a little. <laughs> so to the hall of the afterlife with a lot of kind of drinking of beer, general merriment, potential axe throwing... You're going to take Monopoly with you. Absolutely. That sounds fantastic. <laughs> the, <laughs> the Vikings won't know what hit them. <laughs> I am going to get Boardwalk and Park Place all the time. That's fantastic. <laughs> um, 
Thank you very much for coming on, Chris. This has been um, this has been a lot of fun, and it's always this good. has been great. Thanks uh, for having me. Okay. You're very, very, very welcome. As I say, we will take the um, links that you give us after the show, and we will put them in the show notes so that we have notes to show, as always. Um, if you want to keep an eye on what we are up to, and thank you everybody who's been joining us recently. It's always nice to get some more people listening to the show. Um, we do have some, just lots and lots of various different guests that are going to be coming on up into the run of Christmas. We are not going to get any quieter. Um, keep giving you the content that you want. If you want to keep an eye on what we're doing, Jump on to Google, enter We're Not Wizards, and you will find us on Twitter at We're Not Wizards. You'll find us on Facebook at We're Not Wizards. You'll find us on Instagram at We're Not Wizards. Because our lovely podcast host Podbean automatically put our episodes onto YouTube, if you go to youtube.com forward slash C forward slash We're Not Wizards Tabletop Podcast, you will also find us there. You'll find us on Stitcher and Acast and Podknife and all the other speaker and all these other different places that you can find uh, podcasts as well. As we always say, if you have liked what you've heard tonight, please jump on to the big old Apple podcasts and consider giving us a rating or a review. If you give us a rating or review, um, remember, don't give us a 10 because that will just makes us feel a bit big-headed. But don't give us a one, because that will make us cry. Give us a five, because that's in the middle, and it's average. And we are decidedly average. But uh, the Norse warrior who has not been average tonight is the rather fantastic Mr. Chris Davis. So thank you for coming on, Chris. Once again, thank you for letting me be here. And there's only two more things to do. The first thing is to remember that we are many things, but we're not wizards. Are we wizards, Chris? No. Definitely not. We're Vikings. <laughs> we absolutely <laughs> are. We're, we're standing there with our various powers ready to throw spells at those either to the left of us or right of us or straight in front of us. We're using our strategies. We're using our dice. We are taking our chances, we are taking our hits, and we are causing damage. And one of us, many of us will fall, but only one of us will triumph, for these are the ruins of Ragnarok. So it's a goodbye from Mr. Chris Davis. Say goodbye, goodbye. Chris. And it's oh, a goodbye. <laughs> <laughs> and it's a goodbye from me, remember, stay safe, roll sixes, and check out Ruins of Ragnarok. It is you know, Windborn, they're new. They need your support. Check out the campaign if you think it's going to be something that you're going to enjoy, and it looks like it very much is. Chuck it a buck, because um, it looks very, very interesting indeed. But until the next time, goodbye. Goodbye. <laughs>